since we last saw Annie. Some things have changed. It's just I think that most action movies are really bad. This summer, he's taking us right into an oil tanker. Yeah. Dude, that was the beginning. Jan gave me a career and now he's ending it. <laughs> Speed 2, cruise control. And it gets the job done. I liked it. I liked it too. I was... This is the reason this movie made its further study. Don't get me wrong. Saying that movie reviewers are infallible, even the ones that managed to do it successfully before that job was given to anyone with an internet connection, is a bit like saying that weathermen are infallible. However, while not infallible, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert were the top critics of their time, and both of them decided that this movie, this movie, the one that has been the butt of jokes for a quarter of a century and that literally nobody involved in liked, was actually not that bad. Ebert is even quoted as saying, Movies like this embrace goofiness with an almost sensual pleasure. And so, on a warm summer evening, do I. So, in the spirit of boldly going where everyone else has gone before, let's go ahead and take a look at Speed 2. Who knows? Maybe we'll find something that'll do at literally everyone else on the planet. So, I think it would be best if we address this one right out of the gate. Boats are less scary than buses. In fact, large boats are less scary than most other forms of transportation. That's not to say that they're unable to do vast amounts of damage to themselves, their passengers and whatever they crash into. However, there are a couple of things that rather diminish the threat level compared to a bus. For starters, if you're landlocked, there is very little chance you'll receive a surprise delivery of cruise ship. I'm not saying zero because I've seen weird shit happen before, but it's unlikely you'll wake up in the morning to find that the SS Morro Castle has happened in your front lawn. Buses, on the other hand, stock the land like giant metal stocky things, which makes them much more effective at making suspense. Then there's the matter of speed, kinda important on this conversation. On the original film, the bus could not slow down from 50 miles an hour. A cruise ship, going as fast as it can go, will have a top speed of, at most, 35 miles an hour. And in the open ocean, without any frames of reference like cars, airport gates, women with strollers, it's really hard to convey that that's really fast for something of that size and the destruction that it can cause while traveling at that speed. Quite frankly, the most horrifying part about a cruise ship is spending a month surrounded by 8,000 people that shouldn't be in swimsuits cramped into a floating apartment complex, which moves from port to port, ruining the town it's in for a day in exchange of much needed tourist money and turning the aforementioned apartment complex into a sort of floating petri dish with a stocked bar, not to mention the hundreds of pounds of plastic toys and... What are we talking about again? So you know that charming little moment in the first movie where Sandra Bullock admits why she was riding the bus that day? Driver's license revoked. What for? Speeding. That's a good bit of storytelling. It adds some levity to the work and it's a fun tension breaker. It also adds to the character by association, leaving you to imagine all of the circumstances that led up to that result. Well, in this movie she's the only connection we have to the previous one, so the action prologue is occasionally hijacked by Annie, still played by Sandra Bullock, playing the most useless driver on the planet. Shit. That's not speeding, that's damn near vehicular manslaughter and I am surprised she had a car to begin with. We also have an honest to god action sequence to introduce our sugar free Keanu for the evening, Alex Shaw, played by Jason Patrick. He's here because Keanu decided that he was going to pass the opportunity for the project. In story, his disappearance is explained pretty well, all things considered. I'm telling you, relationships based on extreme circumstances never work out. Right. Yeah, that makes sense within the narrative and is realistic. They knew each other for, what, all of five hours before they were making out on a destroyed subway train with a corpse next to them? Unfortunately, it seems they aren't starting from a place of honesty. You lied to me. You knew that I was a cop. I said there was a... Wait. When did you plan on telling me this? Well, today. Oh, today. Okay. Yeah, which is good you're here. Today yeah. was the day. So, in order to try to get themselves to know each other, they decide to embark upon a cruise ship. If nothing else, they're going to be stuck one with the other for a couple of weeks unless someone decides to get airlifted. This being a cruise ship, I wouldn't blame them. Yes, I know we just talked about this, but I really don't like the cruise ship setting. Especially since director Jean de Bond seems to be intent in filming it like it was a bus. Everything including the scenes that are supposed to be filmed in large halls, seem small and awkward. This came out six months before Titanic, and it revels in filming the ship as horrible and cramped as much as that one revels in filming their boat as grandiose. And unfortunately, our extended cast doesn't seem to be picking up the slack. 
They seem to have been selected by how awkward they could be, and all of them end up looking like Ray Liora and Lorraine Bracco at the end of Goodfellas when they lost their youth, sanity and sobriety. The only one that actually seems to be okay with me is the lovely Death Mute kit in the Nickelodeon Studios Wear collection. Let's put a pin on her. She'll be important later. I'm starting to get a little upset. Yeah. My golf clubs, have you found them? I'm always very happy to help you, sir. After all, we are proud of our capacity to accommodate even the most senseless requests. Who brings a set of golf clubs to the cruise ship? What? Oh, sure. I try to get on the waning days of a meme, only to find myself in the movie where the foe decides to cover himself in leeches. And here I thought I was safe by not getting into Shadow of the Vampire. Maybe, maybe you flip the card. Maybe I flip the card. <laughs> Let's not split hairs. <laughs> Thank you. With that, he proceeds to completely neuter the entire ship from his laptop. Why wouldn't he be able to? This is 1997 after all. And all of the ship's controls are on a single computer without redundancy or fail saves. Also, this boat has to be 95% tending if it shakes like that when one of them blows up. Yeah, they're more useless than the blue screen of death. I gotta give credit to Geiger on this one. Those were clearly on a timer, which means he had to pull off this thing perfectly. Otherwise that phone call would have been a lot more awkward. So while all of this is happening, that little girl gets stuck on an elevator, gets tired of calling for help and gets herself out. All of this makes it remarkable in that she's a precocious little child in an action movie that I would actually like to see survive. You guys, you guys, she's probably on another lifeboat. Oh, we can't leave without Come her. On. I'm sure she's fine. Come on. Come on. Okay, no, I actually have to praise the storytelling again on this one. In universe, everyone thinks she's being annoying and hysterical. After all, all of the other passengers made it safely to the rescue boats. Surely her daughter is on one of them. But we know she's actually stuck in an elevator making us feel sympathy for her, even if she's being an annoying hysterical twit. Geiger sabotaged the communications, nobody knows that those rescue boats are there. Meanwhile, this other group that's been stuck behind doors needs to be rescued. Assuming the doors have no failsafes, there has to be something to pry them. I don't know, a waveboard, a fire axe, one of the shotguns, uh... Why is there a chainsaw on a cruise ship? Why are there two chainsaws on a cruise ship? This is the moment when you realize that they just did a fine replace on the script and switched Jack to Alex. Now, we have been given hints that this was the case, what with his observational powers and his cut telling him that something is wrong, a la Jack on the elevator. However, this one is just blatantly egregious. Okay, we have, um, we have our life vest. We can just we can, we can jump off the ship, right? No, don't go in the water. From what I can gather, the water in here is deadlier than Vice City's. Devotion to company was repaid with the terminal. Oh, sure. That's the guy. Say, have you been looking for a charcoal Nissan Titan recently? Anyway, one of the other things that they wanted to give the foe over Dennis Hopper to make the character more complete was a motivation. Shame they made it such a stupid one. The computers generate electromagnetic fields which over time can cause severe copper poisoning. What? <laughs> I'm a smart guy, Alex. And even I didn't know that. Uh, really no. Six hours after inputting that program. He's taking us right into an oil tanker. Uh, she's anchored 16 miles out and we are doing 17.8 knots. I see, so that's about uh, an hour. How much time left? Not very much. We better hurry. Look, I know you're trying, but you said that 15 minutes ago and that oil tanker isn't getting any closer. Meanwhile, down below, the foe is blessing us with another meme and fleeing, all the while demonstrating that holster computer of his has better Wi-Fi antennas than anything we own. Oh my god! Jeez, we're coming in too fast! How can this happen on our honeymoon? Aww, it's cute that they think we care about them. Where's 
control. We gotta stop her. What? Anchor control? We can't drop it. The ship's moving too fast. <laughs> That's not even the damage side. I guess some things just fail. Well, you know the rest. Crash, crash, the card that they put there and you never actually see hit, and a little kid, and stop. We docked! We docked! Indeed we are. Where is the foe again? What the fu- he's still at sea? What, did he stop to see the carnage? I mean, I would, but I am not doing a daring escape with a hostage. Speaking of which... Why? Why do you need her? Every single emergency vehicle on this island is going to go to that boat. Bullock will have to contend with all of them to reach Alex. You have the perfect setup. Let her go, take your plane, fence the jewels and live however many days you have left in the lap of luxury. But no, he decided that what he wanted to be was an idiot, costing him his escape, his money, and making us all pay an extra quarter per gallon in fuel. Oh, that's nice. Shame they will never actually marry and split up in about three months over some action-related nonsense. So, what do we make of this? Was Ibert wrong? No. Was everyone else wrong? No. It's all just a matter of expectations. Speed 2 is dumb, but big deal, so are many other summer blockbusters. It's a series of action sequences that amuse or delight. Bullock and Patrick for all that they would joke about the movie in the future, actually give decent performances. The foe, unsurprisingly, gives a performance that only he can give. It's a normal summer blockbuster, like The General's Daughter or Contact, and it would probably be as unremembered as those if it had been called anything else. Thing is, it's called Speed 2, and that puts it into direct consideration against Speed, the little low-budget movie that could when it came out. And if you see it like that, of course it will be worse. But what do I know? Check it out and try to forget Speed Exist for an hour and a half, and tell me what you think. Hey, do you think Annie got tired of this shit, decided to pursue a quiet life in Ireland and was one of the housewives in Craggy Island when Speed 3 happened? <laughs> Lord be with you! Last <laughs> today is being offered for Father Duke McGuire.